Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Spring Home Buying Forum. This is day one. Uh, the next couple of days, we will be talking about different topics regarding the Home Buying Forum. Um, we're so happy to have you here this afternoon. My name is Dominique Valgier. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist, and I also have with me Ryan Douglas. He is one of our MLOs. He's our mortgage loan originator. And he'll be joining us and talking about a variety of different things. But before we get started, I wanted to talk up to you, letting you about some household stuff that's happening. We will be reducing the background noises. And if you have any questions, use the Q&A feature. And this is being recorded. So if you miss any part of the presentation or if there's a part of the presentation that you'd like to play again, you can see it on our YouTube channel at MyHUECU. And we'll also have a survey at the end just so you can let us know how we did. So we also wanted to let you know we'll have some prizes and some swag for you. So if you get an email from me or Terrence, who is in the background uh, managing things, it's don't, it's not in your spam. It's not spam. Just uh, look at it and we'll draw out names and uh, we'll send you some swag. But first, I want to talk to you about the uh, credit union. So the credit union is not for profit. Um, it's really community based. So a member, you are a part of the credit union. Um, we operate just like a bank. We have different um, things such as loans, checking, savings, CDs, and you can really access us anywhere. You can do it online or visit one of our branches. And we'd love to see you. And speaking of branches, we have a new one. We opened it a few months ago. It's in the LMA area, the Longwood Medical Area. It's near the Beth Israel West Campus, um, near the Sweet Greens, and right underneath the Jocelyn uh, Diabetes Center. So if you're in the area, please stop by, visit our brand new facility. We'd love to see you and hang out with you and talk to you and help you any way we can. Um, first, we're gonna send that over to Ryan. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of the Mortgage Department at HUECU. I'd just like to welcome you to our Spring Home Buying Forum. Um, now, before we hear from our two experts today, Kim and Dino, I just want to go over a couple of the benefits, you know, of working with us in the Mortgage Department for financing your purchase. So first off the bat, personalized service, we really take pride in getting to know you, work closely with you, and um, making that process as smooth as possible. It is a big one, so we love to work with you in that regard. And then um, we offer a range of mortgage products. So different product for every borrower, and, you know, to fit your specific needs. Uh, for a first time home buyer. So could you just go back there, Terrence? Sorry about that. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so we have a few competitive uh, rates and credits that we offer. So for our first time home buyers, we offer an eighth of a percent discount off of our advertised rates. We also have a great first time home buying program, which we're going to learn more about on Friday. This is allows you to purchase a home with as little as 3% down. And then we also have a closing cost credit that we offer. Our mortgage lending process is digital. So we lend in all of New England states. So wherever you are coming from, you know, no need to come into the branch. We are, we can do everything virtually and, uh, you know, help you get your financing in order. We have in-house loan servicing. So after you close, if you have any questions, any anything going on with your mortgage, just reach out to us. It's all service right in Cambridge. And you know we'll get you in touch and we'll get that all squared away for you. We also offer portfolio lending capabilities and additional relationship credits as well. So just a quick overview for later on in the week. So today we have the market trends. This is going to be with uh, Kim and Dino, who Dominique we're going to introduce in just a moment. Tomorrow, we hope you can join us as well. We have tips from an attorney and home inspector. We're going to have Sarah Riccadelli from Riccadelli and Small, one of our attorneys that we work with, and uh, uh, Sean Rizzo from uh, Tiger Home Inspection will be joining us. And then Thursday, we're going to be going over the home buying process in detail. We're going to have Daisy and Michael, two of our loan officers from the credit union. And then Friday, we're going to be going over the first time home buying with uh, Sharon and Helen from our mortgage department, along with Antonia from the city of Cambridge. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dominique. She's gonna introduce our two experts for today. Thank you very much.
I started talking and I'm on mute. Okay, thank you so much, Ryan. You will see Ryan all this week with myself as well as Terrence, who will be also in the background. So it's a team effort. Um, Ryan will be uh, has been at the credit union for eight years, and he's been uh, dedicated to providing a lot of excellent service for our members. And in 2020, Ryan joined the HUCU's mortgage department, where he continued to provide this excellent service to the members of the Harvard community as they achieve their home ownership. He also enjoys taking time to educate and work with his members closely to make the mortgage process and route to becoming homeowners seamless. And without further ado, we're going to introduce here our pan our presenters. First, Kim Rudolph. She is from Rudolph Appraisal Services. She's been doing this for 31 years as a residential sales broker and appraiser. Kim Rudolph's experience includes working as a reviewer of appraisals for a large New England company. She has worked as a residential appraiser and owns her own appraisal company. Kim's experience includes knowledge of all kinds of single family properties, condos, multifamily dwellings, and new construction projects. Dino Confalone, he is Sotheby's International Realty as a past president of the Greater Boston Association of Realtors, as well as current state and national director. Dino leverages his three decades of real estate and corporate management experience to make our real estate community a lot better. Clients and colleagues describe him as a true partner with the ability to incorporate education, analysis, and empathy into each interaction. Take it away, guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm looking forward to a quick discussion about the market and how things are going and definitely do not want to leave this on a negative note. It's been a tough few years, I have to admit, in the real estate industry. Um, regarding the credit union, I mean, I can't believe this. I, my first car loan was 31 years ago with the Harvard Credit Union. They've been phenomenal and a partner of mine for decades, obviously, and I trust them wholeheartedly. So um, hopefully when you guys are thinking about getting your pre-approval, you'll give Ryan a buzz and uh, go from there. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've had multiple career, uh, I would say dueling careers when corporate management and also real estate. I got my license when I was in college and uh, I really enjoyed the industry and built equity myself and purchased properties over the years as well. Um, I'm very active with the association. Um, I was president of the Greater Boston Association of Realtors in 2021. And um, actually, let's keep, well, hold on. So um, back to my other slide. So just also, I have two kids, huge soccer guy and uh, a coach as well. And uh, we love Star Wars and you'll see that at the end. So back to the Greater Boston Association of Realtors. If you want to go to the next slide, Terrence, um, we're going to talk about big picture, local area, market data, and then a couple of uh, quick tips about the real estate industry. Next slide. So in general, the best way to talk about um, real estate is actually the interest rates when you have to go and get a home loan. And, you know, there's definitely some volatil volatility in the market right now, but we got to look at it from a big picture and holistic perspective. Um, and I, I feel like this chart really helps um, look at the big picture. And over the last 50 years, I did a quick snapshot here. Um, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate in the United States averaged almost 8%, so reaching an all-time high of 18.63 in 1981 and 2.65 in 2021. So right now, they're hovering in the five sixes, depends on what Ryan ends up talking about um, in the next couple of days. But overall, we're still in a good time to buy. Um, it is still a tough time with low inventory. But overall, this is one thing I wanted you guys to see. When I first bought my house in 2002, my interest rate was almost 8%. So I think this is something that shouldn't cause a tremendous amount of concern. Next slide. So what I did is I kind of, we, obviously, we want to look at the big picture and see where inflation is. And basically, people are talking about recession also potentially. So I took a snapshot from the United States Congressional Budget Office, um, and they are projecting a flat, um, basically looking at the federal funds rate, they're looking at a flat rate for the next uh, up to 23, 2033. Um, and as it is, in, it's been a little volatile, as you can see, up until 2023. But hopefully, we're going to be adjusting everything moving forward. Next slide. 
<clears throat> so the reality is infl inflammate, inflation will determine home mortgage rates. Um, until that slows down, we're really not going to know where things stand. But the world economic outlook has a very positive outlook for the next two to three years. Um, recessions are inevitable and necessary part of the economic cycle. Um, I've personally gone through a few myself. And I think at the end of the day, um, the next slide, I think is real. Well, actually, I don't think it's the next slide, but I don't see it in front of me. Um, you will see the value that has been phenomenal um, over the last 30 years. Next slide. So, <clears throat> excuse that. That's my old school landline. I can't believe the first time it's rung in like 20 years. I can't even believe that. So the Greater Boston Real Estate Board <clears throat> has 64 cities and towns in its footprint. And as you can see, there's basically the various regions here that have, unfortunately, it's a little, it's a little um, blurry, but uh, what I did is I pulled market snapshots, and this is getting down into the details within each region. And so each town, like say, hypothetically, if you're looking at a house in Waltham, um, that I have condos and single families um, stats for regarding that. So if you want to go to the next slide. So the way that we look at this as 128 and 495 around the Boston area, and basically buyers coming out of the city have gone as far as 495 to find homes that are less expensive. Obviously, the closer to Boston, the more expensive the houses are going to be. So when looking at this map, we're kind of looking at the 128 belt and the 495 belt, and then moving forward into Western Massachusetts there. Next slide. Um, and then the commuter rails, obviously, where is, which is important for people to get into the city. Um, and you can see how far it goes. Next slide. So here is the market snapshot year over year. So what I did was for Boston, Metro Boston, I did single families and condos. And we have some stats when it comes to price per square foot, um, days on market and inventory. And as you can see, the price per square foot for condos on average is $688 a square foot. Um, and that does include, when it says Greater Boston, that basically goes out to Chelsea, Dedham, Everett. It does include Milton. Newton, Revere, Somerville, Waltham, Watertown, Winthrop, um, and Boston and all the neighborhoods, including Jamaica Plain. So it is it is a high price per square foot. Um, as you go into Boston proper or Cambridge, that price per square foot obviously will go up. We've had a historic low inventory um, over the last few years. And I do admit that um, it's still a seller's market. And we are having a hard time when it comes to getting offers accepted. Um, even in the last few months, it's been slower um, with the seasonality that always comes into play. But I am seeing uh, multiple offers enter the market again within the last few weeks. Um, Valentine's Day was really a hot time. Um, I had a listing that basically got three offers that, that weekend in Watertown. Um, we are going to take questions at the end. So there are two other slides with some mar market statistics as well. Terrence, if you want to go to the next one. So then I basically go out um, towards the Metro West area. Now, these are all single families. I'm no longer looking at condos um, and central Middlesex. And as you can see, the price, uh, the median sales price has skyrocketed up to over a million. Um, the Metro West does include Dover and Wellesley. And then the central Middlesex includes Sudbury, Wayland and Weston. So those are high ticket price um, towns and the price per square foot tends to not be as valid as condos. We tend to see that. Um, really hyper-focused on condominiums. It's tough to price out single families with price per square foot. Um, the median days on market, as you can see, was in the Metro West was 53 and in Central Middles Middlesex was 24. And again, this is year over year. Um, we are seeing properties starting to go back under agreement after the winter months. Uh, next slide. Now we start to expand into the central middle eastern Middlesex and southern Norfolk areas, and that starts to talk more about going out to the 495 range. So the last two slides were more clo you know, closer to the 128 range. And as we go out, um, you see the prices you know, definitely are less than they are in towards Boston. The um, days on market, as you can see, are, are low in the 20s, and new listings about 118 in Eastern Middlesex and Southern Norfolk had about 128. But I do think um, in general, there has definitely been, the market trend has been going to go out to 495 with people working from home more. 
um, they're more comfortable not being as close to the city because not worrying, you know, not worrying about traveling into the city as much. Um, next slide. So this is the, the spreadsheet that I had mentioned earlier that shows values. So home val values in Greater Boston since 2003. And in general, most of the consumers that I've spoken to has have said, you know, is there going to be a dropping of values? Where do we stand? If I buy now, is there going to be a, a you know, the floor coming out from the market? And as a homeowner myself, um, I have only seen an increase. It has been the best investment I've ever made. Um, and as you can see, I have the single family um, on the right and the condominiums on the left. And 2008, 2009, when we had a financial crisis, um, it was definitely a different time. And I think that with you know mortgage-backed securities that were struggling and just the financial collapse, if you will, shows that the value did slightly go down a little bit, but at the end of the day, it, it right, rebounded and then continued to appreciate. So if you purchased a condominium in 2003 at 297, that same condo in last year would be about 660. So, I mean, in my opinion, I feel like it's been the best investment that I've ever made. And I feel like at this point, you just got to get into the market um, and figure out what's best for you. And, you know, rent is 100% interest. Um, and that's the biggest thing that I've determined back in the day when I was talking about, you know, renting versus buying, you know, when we're talking about six or 7%, you know, I ended up refining two years ago for 2%. And that was historical low. I was very happy to do that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, rent is a hundred percent interest rate so that you're not building any equity. And I think it's really the best thing to do is just to jump in if it's the right position for you, right home for you. And it makes you happy. Um, next slide. So that the last few minutes has been basically talking about market um, things that are going on in the market and, you know, talking about various values. Um, I definitely want to talk about some real estate processes and tips. Um, so the number one thing, and everyone's going to tell you, you got to get pre-approved right away. Um, make sure your credit's in order, you know, opening the dialogue with a loan officer like Ryan would be ideal. Um, getting in right now and then figuring out if there are things you have to do with your credit and so forth. And they're going to spend some time in the next few days talking about that process. Um, it is, it's critical to select an experienced realtor. I think there is definitely, you know, there was a time when I got my license and I was really only doing one deal like every other year. And I felt like I was not providing the value that my clients needed. My focus was more uh, corporate management. I was doing that. And I realized as I as I grew in my career that it, it definitely having a committed 100% full time realtor that knows the industry and knows what's going on is going to be most critical for you. You need an advocate in your in your court that's represent you and able to analyze the data and also walk through the entire process because it's definitely a tricky process and you need expertise advice. The realtor is definitely the quarterback in the deal. Um, in the transaction and manages basically all the different personalities, including Kim, which we love, um, inspectors, attorneys, the loan officer. I think there's definitely having that person in your court is phenomenal. Um, so then your realtor will definitely set you up within the, the multiple listing service, uh, which is the primary database that all others pull from. So if you're on Zillow right now or Redfin, all of those um, periphery sites are basically capturing your leads, but they're pulling the data from MLS and a realtor has access to that MLS system. Um, when you do start going to open houses, you know, make sure you're telling those agents that you're represented by a buyer's agent um, and your buyer's agent will be able to run some analysis to make sure that you're making, if you decide to make an offer on the property. So you basically will have that, um, that person in your court telling you or, and, you know, creating a team environment to figure out what the best value is and how the best offer is going to be submitted. Um, so the due diligence time frame, you're going to be, you're going to have a presentation by Sean Rizzo with Tiger Home Inspection tomorrow. He's phenomenal. I've known him for decades and he is one of my closest advocates. I truly feel that Tiger Home Inspection has your best interest in mind. Um, and that's it for the tips. Next slide. So one thing that um, I've had consumers ask me constantly is basically, you know, where should I live? 
where are the best schools and, and items like that. So a realtor really from a uh, Massachusetts fair housing rules indicate that we can't you know, basically advise where to live. I think it is definitely in your best interest to do your own due diligence. There's a lot of press, you know, Boston Magazine has best places to live and so forth. Greatschools.org is, is one of the websites that I use a lot that has some artificial ratings when it comes to schools. I did it for my kids' schools and it pretty much came in pretty, you know, close to on target and with my opinion. Um, it is definitely an opinion type of situation when you start to look for where you want to live. Um, a realtor will help you figure out, you know, where where the best place to live would be. Like if you have to commute to work one or two days a week, a lot of my clients have moved further out to 495, as I've mentioned. Um, one client that is associated with MGH, she basically moved to Attleboro. She's got a new construction townhouse. She's only in the office once a week and she absolutely loves it. And she basically, it was the best decision she's made. She's been there for a year. She's doing really well and happy. So I feel like um, it really does, it's going to take some due diligence for you personally to figure out where the best place to live. Um, and with your with a partner, your realtor, that that's how you will determine where you're going to end up. Next slide. In conclusion, <clears throat> COVID has accelerated people's life plans. I've had a lot of people do move basically before they were expecting to. A lot of babies are coming up, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, so a lot of families, um, consumers, they want more space, basically. There was um, this concept of people bailing out of the city. That never happened. I had a lot of uh, back bay self end clients that basically just decided to stay, but they upgraded. They wanted a deck or a balcony or something. So it's definitely not what people expected. Um, COVID is definitely on the downside, but um, I think there's still some volatility volatility in the market, but overall people are still moving and it's, you know, they're living their lives and they want to be happy. Um, even though there's low inventory, now is the time to buy. That is my opinion. Um, and I'm sure Kim is going to be of the same mindset. The, as I went back to that spreadsheet I showed you earlier, value has really truly never plummeted. Boston is one of the most desirable cities in the world. Um, we have so many different um, industries. And I think this is definitely the place to plant your flag and invest. Um, and then work with a professional realtor. That's basically my presentation. Um, next slide. So obviously um, the Mandalorian came out on Wednesday, so I had to make, make my Grogu in there. And you do need the force to be with you in this market. Um, and I do wish you all the best of luck. Dominique, thank you so much. Thank you. I, we do need the force. Um, we actually have a, uh, some people with um, questions in the Q&A. Please keep them coming. Uh, one of them said, when do you think is the best time to buy the, to buy will be? Should we wait a little bit for the next recession so house prices will fail? And please jump in, Kim, as well as Ryan, as well as Dino. So real quick, um, just two things. And I'm at the 16 minute mark, by the way, Dominique. So I was so happy I got under that 20 minute mark. No, it's just fine. I'm keeping track of the time. No worries. So number one, there is definitely a seasonality to the market. So when you think of seasonality, it's like, it's a wave. So it starts like January is a little bit slower. And then you go into February. And I always say love is in the air around Valentine's Day and things pop. So you basically have a very hot spring market. My God, with that phone again. So um, Valentine's Day to about May, and then it does slow down with the summer months, and then the fall picks up again, and then it slows down again in the winter months. But back to the value question, I do have that spreadsheet, and I think these slides are going to be made available to everyone. There's not going to be a plummeting of value. And um, I mean, no one can predict anything, but that is my general opinion. Kim? I agree. I agree, Dino. I think that... Oh, go ahead, Kim. It's going to be more uh, inventory coming on the market this spring, and hopefully the inventory will not be as low as it has been the last few years, and there will be some stabilization and the frenzy will leave the market. I think this is a very good time to buy. The interest rates overall are low. If you look at how Dino presented, um, but it is still a seller's market. You have to you have to uh, get pre-qualified. Ryan can help you with that. And then you have to learn the market and do your homework with uh, a really good 
broker like Dino that can guide you through. You need, this is a complicated process now because of the lack of inventory and you need someone to walk you through. But now is the time, it's a good time this spring to buy. Anything you wanna add, Ryan, before we continue? Yeah, just, you know, just make sure you are prepared for when you do see that deal out there, you know, get all your ducks in a row, pre-approval, working with a realtor. That way, if you do see something that's perfect for you, you know, you'll, you'll be ready to get in there. It's like Dino's, you know, has touched upon. It's the greatest investment you can absolutely make. Okay, would the first thought really be with you, Ryan, in terms of like, let's figure out how much you are qualified for before we continue on and even connect with Dino? Yeah, generally, that's going to be where we'll start. We usually go with a pre-qualification, you know, kind of just starting the discussion, and then we can move into the official pre-approval letter. Um, definitely come back on Thursday, because we're going to be going over that in detail, um, you know, the whole process with the financing. Okay, Dino? Ryan, I just came up with your new logo. Get your ducks in a row with Ryan Douglas. Ooh, I wasn't even trying to be funny, Pete, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm serious. If you pull someone's credit and you're like, these three things need to get addressed, you cannot oh, man. address. Like that is, Ryan is literally the, the credit. I'm going to be sending you royalties now, Dino. Oh my God. <laughs> all right. Nice job. So, all right, Kim, we're going to go to you and please keep the questions coming because we do have a whole lot of time uh, for the questions at the end. So we can really answer all of your questions fully. All right, Kim, take it away. Hi, everybody. My name is Kim Rudolph. I'm a real estate appraiser for residential sales and refinances. Uh, I, I've been in the, in the real estate construction industry since I graduated from college. And it's been a long and very interesting, fascinating road for me and my family. I am one of the people that have left the North Shore, where I have lived for over 30 years, and I am now in Southern New Hampshire. So I am one of the ones that actually looked outside an area where I thought I would always live. And my husband and I, I have horses, and now we live on a four acre farm, and I have a big rooster and hens. And so it was a big lifestyle, and one that really surprised me. So my husband loves it. So, so I was the one that ventured outside the comfort zone of an area that I loved and found a whole new, whole new lifestyle. So I'm the person that they contact when you put an offer in and it's accepted and they have to find an appraiser to go out to give an objective estimate of value of the property. So what we do is we go into MLS and we pull the most recent sales, especially where the market has been so um, volatile, and we've had these frenzies in some of the in some of the spring markets and falls. So we look at days on market. We look at recent sales that are very comparable. Maybe there's some sales in the neighborhood or within one mile. That's the typical guideline. However, because of the low inventory, we've had to go out three miles, five miles, perhaps not in the city, but outside. Um, sometimes you have to go to another town to get something similar. And so it's, it's like a house puzzle that you put together, staying within the uh, appraiser guidelines. You know, you look at the same location, maybe the same style. Sometimes you can't use the same style, same size, age, Room counts, does it have the same renovations? Uh, similarities that if you were looking, going out to look at three or four houses, say with Ryan, those may be the ones that I pull up when I do the, when I do my research and I say, this is most similar. This one's a little bit bigger. This is a little bit smaller. This is, with, is within the range. And that's how, we go through the process. We are trained after 10 years experience. It takes a long time to learn how to, to uh, adjust in the market grid, they say, in the appraisal report for amenities, quality, condition, and, and it becomes an adjusted range. And then we say, okay, this estimate of value of what was offered is or, or is not within that adjusted range and is supported by the sales. So we don't go out and say, 
this is what I think you can get for your house. We have to support that value for the lender and say, this is supported. This is a value of the sale price. So that's how um, the appraiser starts out on the process and we meet the broker at the property. We'll have questions. How many offers did you have? Were there any concessions? Um, how many days on the market? And surprisingly, which may be a surprise to you, they don't always take the highest offer. So it's not if you have the highest offer, if you'll get the property, it's if you have the most solid offer and may, perhaps more flexible in this market. So we can go to the next slide. So people movement trends. If people are moving because they have the ability to work from home, they don't have to commute every day. That's a big plus. Uh, and it's been, that technology has really changed that. Uh, you can may have lower taxes, you have lower prices, you may get more for your value, you may get some more land. You have to, you have to think of what's important to you and what you would, what you would like. For instance, my husband and I, we wanted to have, we were in Manchester, Mass, and we wanted to have on a half acre, we wanted to have more land. And so I could bring my horses home. And that was the primary care thing. And a, a broker, even though I'm in the business, a broker found us the property. This was two years ago. There were six offers. It was a frenzy. We almost didn't even get the appointment to get in. But but as luck would have it, my broker worked for me, even though I'm in the business. She did a very good job and we came through and we said, okay, what do we have to do to get the property? And the broker can help you with that. So uh, the next, supply and demand. This has been key over the last few years, as Dina was said, it's been such a low inventory. I've never seen this before. I'm hearing that there's going to be some more listings coming on this year. People that have been waiting in the wings to list their property, perhaps now they're ready. So that's a very good sign. We, I have seen some that will stabilize a lot of the market, segments of the market, depending upon where you're looking. Because you have to remember supply and demand, the more inventory that is there, there will be less competition from when you go in to put your offer. And it will stay, it can stabilize the market. So there, I don't think there will be any more frenzy, frenzy. And your, uh, your real estate broker can guide you through that, of that particular market that you're looking at. So what I'm seeing here, uh, our, our territory for my appraisers right now is basically Essex County in Southern New Hampshire. So we are still seeing properties getting multiple offers. That's very recently because the market is we're going into the spring market and properties are still selling close to or over the list price. Not all, but it's still, it's still there. I've noticed from talking to the brokers that it's not as many offers. So maybe perhaps they would get six offers or 10 offers. Now I'm hearing three or four offers. That's good news. Okay, so what is a strong offer? Next, please. So these are different options that I have learned and I've used myself. Uh, it is up to you, but these are just options so that to educate yourself for when you're with your broker, like my husband and I were outside the property on the street and my husband said to me, what do we have to do to get this property? Okay, here we go. So you can offer a larger deposit check. That's an option. Instead of 1,000, you could offer 2,000, 3,000. And that's, that means I want this property and I, can, and I have the money. That sends a message. So that, that can help with the offer. A flexible closing date geared for the seller the seller's convenience, perhaps the seller hasn't, hasn't secured a property yet or is waiting to move. Um, that's always a very positive thing to put into an offer. Uh, in some cases, 
if there are, if you know there are multiple offers coming in and you think that the property was some priced a little low, which sometimes can happen, um, then you can put in an escalation clauses, which increases your offer up to a certain point. You can say, well, this is what we'll offer, but we could go up a thousand dollars up to another five thousand dollars to secure the property. So that's up to your broker to explain to you, but it is something that you should know about because that can be a tool for you if you find a property that you love. Um, a seller may ask for rent back for a month or two because they have not found a property. And when my husband and I put this property into agreement over or above, and we had we said the seller can have a choose the closing date. Um, they asked for a rent back. And I had seen it in purchase and sales before, but I had never, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'd never experienced it before. So this is a this was the last uh, negotiation point that my husband and I had, and we said, "Oh, we have to give an arm and a leg and a rent back." <laughs> and we did. And so we were lucky and we got the property, and it was the best decision that we made. So there there's a different tools that you can use if you find the property that's perfect for you. then, these are things that you need to learn and, and um, can make the process easier for you because you won't be surprised and say, what, what's that? How, what, what's that? This way you will be prepared. Okay, next. So get, get, get pre-qualified with, with your loan officer. Ryan can help you. And it's very important to do this bef before, not a week before you go out to start looking at a property, you should do this right now because you wanna know if, how, how is your credit? Is there anything that you can do to improve your credit and what would that be? So you need to get educated so you have a strong foundation in a, in a, with your offer and say, no, yes, we can afford this. We've been pre-qualified and there were no surprises. So that's very, very important. So that's step number one. Um, invest time in learning your market. And as Dino said, when you, if you decide, well, we're going to start to go on open houses, learn the market, say this, oh, this looks good. So this is what we can, this is basically what we can get in our price range that we're comfortable with. So we don't live for our house. This is, this is good. So you, you, you have your broker, they can call the other broker and say that you're coming or you, you bring their card and say, this is our buyer's broker that we're working with. And you can go in and to the open houses and you'll be surprised how quickly you can learn the market. If you go into like seven or eight open houses in, in, within a range, you'll say, oh, this is, I think this is price high. This is how you learn the market. You can drive by houses and say, oh, we're not gonna go to the open house, but this isn't really, this is too far out for us. But this is how you learn. And you're going to have to do some homework with your broker. And again, the experienced broker. You're going to need an experienced broker to guide you through. Be flexible in your mindset because no property is perfect. And it's not, well, I really wanted a granite kitchen. But you can make that a granite kitchen. You can, a paint goes a long way. And new flooring, pick the location. Pick the location that works for you. You can consider two families and you'll have additional rental income. And condominiums are also a good way to enter the market for some people because some people don't have time to be mowing the lawn and shoveling the snow. So there are a lot of options out there. It can be overwhelming, but if you are prepared, you will find the right property for you. Okay, the next questions. I'm back. Yes, and there are tons of questions. So it's a, about 20 minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, we're going to start taking all the questions. So the first one is, what should we look for in a realtor? What questions to ask to make sure 
we find someone experience. Um, How many years? <laughs> How many years have you been doing this? Yeah, I think it just comes down to, I mean, referrals, that's pretty much other than this um, forum. I mean, I do have a lot of referrals over the years. Um, it's basically just someone that's proven themselves, that know the market, um, and is that quarterback that everyone trusts. You know, all the attorneys that we work with, um, they trust us, the lenders trust us, and it does come down to that. I mean, you definitely want to be careful and not get um, swept up with your sister's friend's cousin's boyfriend. That's agree. that's when you see some problems happening. Um, and then it just turns out to be a complete mess. Yeah. Cause your broker can save you and get you that deal. And you and if you pick someone that's not experienced and savvy, your broker can lose you that deal. So it's very, very important, at least five years experience and not your cousin, Joe. <laughs> okay. Someone experienced um, like Dino. Okay. Someone says, um, asks, how do you find out if a realtor is a buyer's agent versus a seller's agent? So first, there's a difference between a realtor and a sales agent. So basically, when you pass the real estate test, you get the license from the state of Massachusetts and you are called a licensed real estate salesperson. If that person decides to get more involved and join the trade organization called the Greater Boston Real Estate Board. Um, then they start taking classes, education, ethics. There's like a certain minimum of continuing education you have to take. And then, so the realtor is definitely someone that has committed to the industry and that is taking this job seriously. The salesperson is basically just trying to work on their own. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely, that's the biggest distinction. Once you become a realtor, you can do both. So I am a seller's agent and I'm also a buyer's agent. And that's mm -hmm. something that I choose to do. And everything is fully disclosed. And I represent sellers that want to sell their house. And then I also take calls from buyers that want to buy houses. So that is, when you walk into an open house, most likely that person is representing the seller. So you, I would say, in my opinion, that you should be represented when you're walking into an open house. You don't want to go in there by yourself and have that seller's agent try to sell you the house. You're not going to get any benefits from that. Your benefit is truly being represented by a true realtor. Hey, Ryan, you see you, you're itching to say something. Go ahead. Oh, me? Oh, no. Uh, oh, no, okay. I totally <laughs> agree with you. Yeah, no, I nailed that one. Sorry. Okay. Um, the next question, if you're working with a realtor and you think they have underpriced a condo that you are selling, what should you do? So, sorry, Kim, most of these are like in my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that is a strategy that some seller's agents try to do. You know, they, mm -hmm. they say a, a condo that in that everything in the neighborhood is selling for 500 and they put it on for 400 because they want to get offers and they're trying to get it competitive, you know, so that, that is a strategy that people have done. But the way that you avoid anything like that is you basically are working with your, your buyer's agent that knows the market and can tell you this one, this is the strategy the seller's agent's trying to do. So you're having a conversation. You're not in the industry and going to open houses by yourself. You are having intelligent conversations with someone about what is going on. So whether it be overpriced or underpriced, you're going to be represented and you're going to have that conversation with that professional. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think this is a, a question. Um, this a, it's an answer and a question based on what you said earlier, Kim. So someone said exactly in multiple hard credit pools negatively impact your credit score. Can you negotiate an extension beyond the 90 day period? Oh, no, I answered this one. This was about uh, okay. the pre-approval letter for the credit okay. check. So uh, that's non-negotiable, unfortunately. So every 90 days, if you want to reissue that pre-approval certificate, we'll have to run a new credit check for you. Okay. I and, didn't get a chance to answer it. Oh, no, no, answer. that's fine. Yeah, no problem. If somebody asks, if you were in a lease until summer of 2024, when do you suggest we start the process for after that? Um, I mean, just in my opinion, you know, formulating a plan is the best way to go about this. So, I mean, if it's you have your timeline for 2024, you know, give us a call and we'll start, you know, kind of walking you through the process and get you on track to meet that goal, you know, for you. 
Someone says, um, excuse the ignorance, but I'm new to the U.S. and barely have five months of credit history and have never rented before as I am staying with family. Would I be able to consider buying this early if I have a good salary? Yeah, I mean, that's something we can, you know, there are multiple ways we can, you know, look at this. You can, if you don't have traditional credit, we have other ways, you know, if we can, we can kind of work with you specifically on it. It's, you know, it's gets kind of a specific question, but absolutely, there's non-traditional credit that we can, you know, assist you with. Okay. Um, someone um, asked the next one. Thanks so much for hosting this session. I know a session more focused on affordable housing will be offered later this week, but are there any insights, any tips? Dino is able to share specifics for first time and single buyers looking to shift from renting to buying in an expensive market with higher interest rates in a competitive market. I know that very well. And if I'm interested in learning more about the market and home condos significantly under the median amounts uh, mentioned, 250K or less, this is a long one, but go for it, Dino. So, I mean, it's just, it's it's a brutal reality. Like if, you, if you're looking in the back bay, you know, I mean, there's really, unless it's a new construction building with some affordable units in it, you're really not going to be able to touch it. And no matter how strong of a buyer you are. It's just the market is just, it's a brutal market. So I think a lot of my clients have, have been forced to move out of the city and go into other um, neighborhoods that have a, a better price per square foot. It's, it's a brutal answer and I'm sorry. Uh, um, I don't know what else to say about that. Okay, it's about a quarter of um, the hour. Uh, after getting approved, how do we get someone to start with uh, the process? I've been wanting to buy a house a few years now and I'm very scared about the about the right person helping me in the process that they might not be able to help me fully and see what I am interested in. Um, so most, I mean, a buyer's agent will do a consultation. You know, it's pretty basically like a strategy session, you know, meet in person, go through the MLS. Um, at that point, hopefully you've been pre-approved um, and then just create a marching plan and just figure out what, where you're going to do. You got to narrow it down to specific neighborhoods um, and then go from there. That's, that's what I recommend everyone doing a consultation strategy session with your realtor. How can the Boston market housing prices continue to increase at the pace that occurred over the last decade? Wouldn't this increase the median price for a condo to 1.3 million in 10 years or so? So you can look at that spreadsheet I put together in my slides <clears throat> that show the appreciation year over year. And if you want to do a percentage, I mean, then you could just basically do that, basically using that spreadsheet I put together. For renovations, what is recommended rule of thumb for dollars input? So when, so if you're a buyer, um, that's a tough one. I mean, you don't really want to go with the rule of thumb because each contractor is going to be different. You don't really know where someone stands with their profitability. So I would say, hopefully you can get a referral for a general contract. If you're walking into an open house and you know the kitchen needs to be renovated, I think, you know, you're going to get three different quotes from three different general contractors. I mean, you could be wanting granite countertops versus, you know, I think it's just, it's a can of worms. I think each individual situation is going to be a different conversation. I heard people mention about references. I don't have a lot of people who can refer me with a good slash great agent. I'm like a baby in this process. I don't want to start the process with the wrong process and get, get it wrong. Well, so, I mean, everything starts with your loan officer. So Ryan would have opened the dialogue, as you can say, Ryan. Um, and then usually I do get a lot of referrals from my loan officers. So I feel like that's kind of where things are happening. <laughs> and this probably uh, Kim can answer this. Can you please uh, comment on Southern New Hampshire home sales outlook, pros and cons of owning in New Hampshire versus Mass? Different lifestyle. <laughs> um, it's less is less density, so you will have you would have um, less to choose from. Um, but there's also less competition because. A lot of people want to be in and around the city. So if you were wanted to take a drive up and look at Southern New Hampshire, Newton, Kensington, uh, Hampton Falls, 
Hampton. So you have beaches, you have mountains close by. There are a lot of trails. I noticed up here, there's a lot of active people move up here because there is so much outdoor lakes, you know, boating, fishing. There's so much. That's what I notice up here. That's not why I moved up here, but um, I do spend a lot of time out, more outside. Even though I'm an appraiser that spends a lot of time outside, I'm outside most of the time now. So I would say there's less density, so there's less to choose from, but it's a beautiful area and the prices, you can get a lot more value for, for your money. So if you are in a position where you don't have to commute, you don't have a long commute and you can do that, it's, it's definitely worth exploring. What are the pros and cons of buying this spring, summer with less than 20% down versus waiting until 2024 and having 20% down? So I would say that's a Ryan question. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I mean, purchasing at any time, it's obviously going to be, you know, the greatest investment that you can make. So, I mean, there are options out there, you know, even if you are below 20% or over that 20% mark. Below that 20% mark, you will just have to factor in there will be private mortgage insurance due. But I mean, you know, it's something it's not for life. So it's not going to be for the entirety of the loan. And once you do get to that 80% loan, the value, you know, will, the PMI will be eliminated. And then in theory, you home is going to be, uh, you know, it's you're going to be building equity, you know, in your home. So it's it's always a good time. There's always options out there for you. Hey, someone, um, when following renovations, should you have the house reappraised? Kim, what do you think? I guess, I guess you're asking to get it reappraised, mm -hmm. reappraised for refinancing or if you had PMI. Um, renovations do make a difference. I would say as far as from the appraisal standpoint, if someone purchased a house that needed some work, the biggest um, value increase that for from the appraisal standpoint is the kitchen and the bathrooms. Yeah, so, this is just, oh, sorry about that. Is no, that this is just like a basic no, renovation. I was just gonna... <laughs> and, and then one, one mistake I think people make is they'll spend a lot of money in their basement. And I don't, and I don't mean media rooms, I mean just finishing the basement. But because it's, Below grade, it it's, doesn't have as much value as above grade. People make these mistakes. So if you're going to renovate and you'd like to expand it like a kid's room in the basement, that's wonderful. But do not put too much money into the renovations of a basement. Brian, did I answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I just wanted to touch on the financing portion of that, you know, great time to have it reappraised is obviously if you're, you know, you purchase the home, you do significant updates, you know, you can really have some value in there and a refinance if you're looking to do a cash out refinance rate and term to eliminate your PMI. So, you know, anytime after those are done, you know, it's great to take a look at the, you know, the big picture there on your financing and your, you know, your current mortgage terms it could be an excellent time. Another renovation and what renovations updates hold the highest value? I think Kim just hit those. Yeah. Kitchen, kitchen and bathrooms. Yep. Okay. I'm looking in Newton and Wellesley, and my realtor has told us that we have to waive all contingencies in these towns to even uh, have an offer considered. Have you seen uh, any many circumstances where the appraisal value is coming in much lower? No. No. <laughs> and on that note, on that note about waving things, and uh, Mr. Rizzo tomorrow will drop the hammer with the whole concept of dropping home inspections, creating liability issues for everyone involved. So, I mean, that was unfortunately something that was happening the past few years, but no one in this industry recommends waving a home inspection. Okay. What happens if you put an offer down on the appraisal is lower than expected? Um, then they go back to the negotiation table. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
There's been a number of bills proposed in several states attempting to impede investment firms purchasing slash owning single family homes. I'm not aware of any bills locally, but I'm curious if one of those bills passing is a possibility and how it might impact home prices. So, um, so I'm very active with the association and we were in City Hall last week talking about rent control and Mayor Wu's office is all for it. And there are also other things, and basically the investment from large corporations came up in the city council meeting. Um, so I do feel that um, the state house is becoming a lot more progressive when it comes to tenant right advocates. And they, I can definitely see some sort of bills coming down the road for any type of large investment houses buying single families and also just trying to jack up rents and so forth. So it is definitely on the horizon. Uh, what do you think that inventory will increase? It seems that if someone currently has a mortgage of 2.5%, they would be crazy to sell and take out a mortgage at 6.5% unless they absolutely had to, but maybe that's an oversimplification. So in my experience, life happens every single day. People's situations change. And that's why I've been in business, to be honest. People buy and sell homes every day, regardless of the, of the interest rate, regardless of in, mm -hmm. lack of inventory and so forth. So it's just, again, we are in a very, very phenomenal <laughs> in city. Boston has so many different um, industries. We have people buying and selling all the time, even though they're in a 2.5, you know, they have another kid, they outgrow their his, house. It's just a constant cycle. Dominique, you're on mute. Okay. okay. Oh. What I'm trying to learn when I am learning the market. I'm not sure I understand the question. What am I trying to learn when I'm learning the market? So it's like going shopping and say you're looking at, for kayaks and you say, well, I'm looking at this kayak or this kayak is too big. I don't need an ocean kayak. You, once you go in and you start looking at open houses or going with your broker and they're showing you three, four uh, showings at a time, this is where you learn what you really, really want in a property and what you can say, well, you know, this wasn't as important as I thought. And you will be able to see the value. So it's basically the process of or kick it going out and, and looking at different cars and that's how you learn say oh so i actually thought i was going to buy this car but i fell in love with a completely different type of car after i saw what the amenities were or you know i don't know how, how do you explain it you know you don't know until you go out and you start looking and you get yeah. the knowledge of you, really you say i love this house <laughs> a really busy street that that, that bothers me but that may not bother somebody else it's it's so personal but you will see the market you will see the value okay uh we have um we have a hard stop at one o'clock in terms of recording the session but we have an additional 30 minutes for all the uh, people who want to stick around and answer the questions because there's a lot of information uh, so we're going to send uh, have one more question um before we wrap the at, at the uh, at the hour and then we'll stick around to answer additional questions but one of the questions is i made a mistake of asking for a booking directly on zillow mm -hmm. what is zillow agent and how do they um, relate to the seller's realtor and my own agent Okay, that's it's actually really simple. Uh, Trulia um, and Zillow are the same company. Redfin, they're all companies that are basically in business to capture your leads, and they are selling those leads. They're, they're selling your email address. That's what's happening. So I'm a realtor. I work for Sotheby's International Realty. I am a member of the multiple listing service, and that's the primary database. That mm -hmm. is basically where everything comes from. So mm -hmm. Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, all the other, whatever they're called, move to, I mean, there's like a million of them. What they're doing is they're coming to realtors like me and, and agents and saying for a thousand dollars a month, if you give me a thousand dollars a month, I will give you all these email addresses that contact all these listings of ours. And that's what happens. So when you reach out to a property on Zillow, 
you're getting someone that's not necessarily, I would say 100%, they're not a, associated with the property. They are just trying to capture you as a buyer's agent, and then they will reach out to the seller's agent and try to get you into the house. It's very confusing. And I'm surprised the Department of Justice hasn't basically put a stomp down on Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, because they are in the business to basically just capture your leads and try to sell you something. Okay, so for those of you who have to log off at one o'clock, I just wanted to remind you, it's not just Ryan, but we have, um, Terrence, you can put the slide up for me. It's not just hi, Ryan, but we have a team of great um, MLOs who are here to assist you. So definitely reach out to them. And again, this is being recorded, so you can have access to um, a lot of the slides. And of course, log on to huecu.org slash home dash dash loans for more information about all of the different loan products that we have here. Next slide, please, Terrence, um, here at HUECU. And then we also have a survey, huecu.org slash survey, so you can let us know how we did. And we will have another session tomorrow. So uh, join us again at noon tomorrow. And again, we're not... Uh, you know, um, just giving you some tips and just to kind of help you in that journey because it is a long journey. Uh, there are a lot of different information out there. And of course, um, just talk to your realtor and your financial advisor. And next slide, please, Terrence. And they will also um, give you specific things that will um, be for you um, and your needs. And of course, stay with us. So for those of you who can hang on and, and, and talk to us, we're going to answer your questions as well. So one of those questions is, what does rent buyback really mean? Um, so there's in Boston, there's no rent buyback. I mean, that's just not part of our our demographic, if you will. Um, but what that would say is probably in another part of the country when real estate values are not as strong, um, you could basically get into a property and rent it for a certain amount of time and make an agreement with the seller or the owner to purchase the property. But that is not... I have never heard of that in the state of Massachusetts. Someone also put, if you have a rerun, have them to rerun your credit for your pre-approval, does that affect your credit score and approval? Um, yeah, so we do have to rerun it. It is going to be a hard, you know, credit check. It will have minor, you know, adverse effect there. It's once every 90 days that we'll have to just reissue it, you know, and take a take a peek at your, you know, credit, make sure everything's kind of the, the same as when we previously had the conversation or if we need to reevaluate anything. So we'll have, sick, you know, slight effect on you. I've brought two properties previously, but my husband has never brought a home. If you're looking for a home to move into, can we put it under his name or take advantage of the first time home buyer programs, even if we are married? Yeah, as long as one of the borrowers hasn't had ownership in a property in the past three years, you know, they're eligible to be a first time home buyer, even if they've previously owned one, as long as it's been three years or longer, you know, you're absolutely eligible. Is a 650 credit score too low to start looking? Um, not with the credit union. We actually, so as long as you have a 620 or higher, happy to help you out. And uh, one great thing we do here is we also don't fluctuate the rate based on your credit score. You know, a lot of places will. Ours is 620 credit or higher. You're getting our advertised rate, no problem. We have a pre-qualification from HEVCU. Can one shop for a home in the state of New York? Unfortunately, at this time, we're not lending in the state of New York. We're only in the New England states. Um, definitely check back, though, in the future. Hopefully, we will be expanding. And uh, can painting a house increase the appraisal amount? That's for you, Kim. Interior or exterior? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the exterior of a house can will it can increase the value the interior hmm. that's very subjective okay but the exterior and, and don't do bright colors please keep it simple. Oh, hold on Dominique can I just make a comment sure so if and Ryan if if it's an FHA loan and there's chipping paint on the exterior that could potentially cause an issue I don't know if you wanted to go into that at all uh, so we act, we're actually not an FHA lender, unfortunately, but you know, I mean, there is that inspection, you know, with the FHA, so you could run into an issue just to briefly touch on it. 
Any financing tips for doctors with medical school buying uh, for the first time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, you know, we have a doc, great doctor's loan program at the credit union, specifically for our physicians. You know, we're really in touch with the MGH community and, you know, Dana-Farber and the teaching hospitals. So um, it's one of those things I would absolutely just schedule a time to talk with one of the five loan officers and we'll walk you through that. Okay. Um, someone says, is a J-1 holder also eligible for HVCU's home loan? Yes, we, we can. We can lend. Okay. Uh, here's another one. Uh, with a pre-qualification from HVCU, can one shop? Oops, sorry, repeating this. Um, here's another one. Okay. If you get asked to sign a form that says the realtor will be presenting you, representing you, can I get a new realtor or do I have to stay with the one I have now? So it depends on the contract that you sign. Um, most contracts can be terminated. You got to read the fine print of that specific contract. Unfortunately, there isn't a consistent buyer agency contract. There is one with the greater real estate board. Um, but if it's like a hand, if it's like a word doc, then most likely that agent created on their own. If it says the greater Boston real estate board at the top of the form, then it's a standard form and those can be terminated. All right, I'm looking here. Uh, is there any data behind the assertion that employing a realtor produces better outcomes? It seems like it should be easy to show that it saves buyers time and or money. So I do not have data in front of me. Um, we have done some research with for sale by owners, which is a seller trying to sell on their own. And historically, they've we've hiring a realtor will give you most likely a 10% higher value than trying to sell your house on your own. I don't know of any buyer data that has been accumulated over the years. I can try to find some though. Um, what about buying a foreclosed property? So it could potentially be a headache. Um, that's just buyer beware, do your due diligence, make sure that um, you have an inspection, obviously, um, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a longer process and it's very tedious. How much is your credit score affected by a hard pull for pre-approval and what does HUC consider a good credit score? So um, good credit score, you know, again, 620 or higher, we can lend to you. And then, you know, if it's, if you're looking at PMI, if you have a 740 or higher, that's, you know, that's the top range that we would like, you know, just for, to get you, you know, for the better tier of the credit scores there. As far as how much it affects you, it's really minor. It's a, it's a few points, you know, it's not going to be anything drastic. Do we need to be a member of HUECU to benefit from your team? No, absolutely not. Um, I mean, it's, you'll need to open up a membership, you know, prior to closing, but if you're eligible, you know, we have a huge range of eligibility, just reach out to us, no pressure, you know, to open a membership, we can assist you. Um, there's another one. Does work permitting affect appraisal value or renovation permits pulled or requested during uh, appraisal? Uh, yes, depending on some, what work, if there's an addition, and it also depends on the town. So if they've if there is an addition or uh, if there's a major renovation and we check with the town make sure that there is a permit and then the, per, the permit number goes in the appraisal what steps do i need to take to be ready to list my house for sale so basically do a walkthrough with your listing agent your seller's agent and go through and figure out if there's any improvements that need to be made or beautify it, you know, just to make it more HDTV-ish, um, sign the contract, get the photos, and then there's a process to put it on the market. Someone put, does citizenship versus green card um, affect your mortgage options? Um, with some lenders, it might, but uh, with us, we can, we can assist you with either or. Since you said exterior painting is more important than interior painting, what is the best color for it? <laughs> I just said like don't do bright colors like like a purple or something that you know you want to conform to the neighborhood hmm. to the color. Just conform okay. to the neighborhood. 
sometimes it's, you know, have you ever gone driven by like a, a pink house? I have. <laughs> <laughs> There's one you I see. Oh, no, I, I don't gym. want to praise that one. <laughs> <laughs> so just conform, the colors conform to the neighborhood. You know, it's common sense. All right. And can you comment on property taxes in New Hampshire versus Massachusetts? Property taxes are a little bit more in New Hampshire, but um, you don't pay sales tax. They, it, so it's either or. Um, people that live here, you know, this is my second year. Um, people that live here say that it's, it's definitely worth it so that you get taxed on your property. But uh, other taxes, you don't pay other taxes and your sales taxes. And um, I think Social Security, they don't do not charge, they don't pay a state tax on. So there are other benefits that outweigh the property tax. Dominique, I just want to make a yes. comment. So um, residential property tax, there are discounts for living in certain cities and the consumers on this call should be aware of that. So when they eventually purchase a condo or a single family in certain towns, like obviously Boston, Somerville, Watertown, um, and you basically call, it's called a residential exemption on your property taxes. So that's a discount and you should file for that. Um, mm -hmm. Very important. Talk to your broker about it. Yeah, excellent point. What does it mean if my buyer's agent hasn't had me sign anything? That's okay. I mean, it's very old school. Uh, up until a few years ago, I didn't have any of my buyer clients sign anything. It was just, you know, a handshake. Um, but over the past few years, it's definitely becoming more um, prevalent to have a contract with your buyer agent. So it's not a, it's not a problem. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to make sure a realtor is LGBTQIA plus and understand the issues of LGBTQIA plus couples? So we have um, organizations within the association. Um, I'm a member of one of them, and I feel that there is it's, it's a one on one type of thing. It's not something that us realtors advertise. You know, I think it's definitely it's a different market than it has been over the last few years. That's the only way to describe it. And I think you just you just have those meetings, you interview realtors and you kind of get the vibe. You can ask them point blank um, and it just see what their reaction is. I think it's a personal thing. And I think you can just basically determine that like right off the bat if someone's right. not cool. Um, do you guys have any insights about Rhode Island? Any advice will help? Yeah, so I mean, Sotheby's has Every state, we have Sotheby's in every state. Um, one of my good friends is from Bristol, Rhode Island originally, and uh, I refer a ton of business down to Narragansett. My wife went to University of Rhode Island. Um, so again, it's all about referrals and knowing people. And so that's how, you know, with the lenders and the real estate agents and the appraisers, it's, it's a very small community and everyone knows each other. So if you're buying something or selling something in Rhode Island and you have a broker here in, this, in Boston, ask that person for a referral. Does the seller still generally pay the broker's fees? So the commission is triggered by the transaction. And so for, for a long time, people would say buyers are not paying the commission. But in reality, buyers are bringing the commission to the table. The seller is still historically determining what that compensation structure is. Um, online, you... So the Department of Justice basically and the National Association of Realtors came to terms with an agreement that all compensation has to be disclosed. So you will see what that compensation is on MLS is. So your buyer agent, full disclosure, will know what they're getting paid and you will as well. But that number is determined by the seller. And the basically when the purchase happens, that's when the, the commission is paid out. So in a way it's kind of, it's paid by both the buyer and seller. Right. Um, we don't have a lot of new questions um, for the panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. You guys have any last words, anything that you'd like to add? Um, as you can do that, I will still continue to check the Q&A to see if we have any questions. Kim, anything? I, I think it's this spring is going to be a great time to buy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they get you get your ducks in a row. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> and go for it. Yeah, it's worth it. 
And um, I do have one. The force Go ahead. <laughs> oh, may the force be <laughs> true. Um, someone did put, can you, uh, can HBCU provide any guidance, advice, or referral services related to construction loans for residential properties? Um, so yeah, we currently don't offer any construction loans, but um, I mean, the best thing you can do is I would just recommend searching around, go on Google, you know, take a look and see what's out there for lenders that can, you know, handle that type of loan program for you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, we will, we are recording this, as I said before, it will be on our um, YouTube channel. Ah, oh, see, it's just as we're going. Someone, is there a down payment requirement for a second house? Is that you, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. Yep, so for a second home, um, there is a requirement. It's a 10% or more you'll need to put down for a second home. Okay, any more questions? Let me see. Um, we've already answered these. Um, right. Any advice for all cash buyers? <laughs> if you are lucky enough to have that cash. <laughs> Cash is still king. Yes. Well, hold on. I was going to say. <laughs> Mic drop. Mic drop on that one. Dominique, that's a can of worms. I've had cash <laughs> not get properties. Really? Yes. So it's not always king. I'm sorry, Kim. But wow. It down to the terms. and That's the price. Oh, wait, that's right. The terms. Okay. Um, I've, the other ones I've already asked. Um, let's see. Any more questions? Um, we still have a few more minutes if you'd like to continue to go in there and, and put uh, your question. Okay. Don't have any new ones. Uh, wait, we can wait. Someone else just put one. Are there um, any buying programs for nurses? For nurses, uh, currently no, specifically just you know conventional loan programs. Please keep the questions coming. We still have time. It's for you. We're here to help you and answer all of your questions. There's another one. Uh, to further clarify on the down payment for the second home, is that to waive the PMI for the second home? No. So, I mean, it, it's as low as 10% down. You know, if you're going to be under that 20% mark, there's going to be PMI required as well. That's just an underwriting guideline that is required, you know, since it is not going to be your primary residence, it's going to need a little bit more of a down payment required. Someone asked again if they're um, about foreclosed property. Um, I, I, what was the question? I didn't see the question. What about buying a foreclosed property? Oh, again, just buyer beware. You don't know what you're, you're getting into and it's a tedious, mm -hmm. long process. I mean, if you want to elaborate, I think that's the only way you got to be careful getting into, getting into it and make sure you don't buy it with someone already living in it. And can HUC provide any guidance, advice, or referral services related to construction loans for residential properties? Um, I already asked that one. Um, any advice, Ryan? Um, you know, just touching back on what I said before, just taking a look at reviews and, uh, you know, everything on Google there. Are there, uh, here's another one. Hold on, a new question. Hold on. First time home buyer is typically 3%. Is the interest rate typically the same? Yep. So with the credit union, you put the 3% down, that's, you know, it, for the first time home buyer, you're going to receive that discount, but it's not going to fluctuate even with a 3% down payment. Okay. Uh, what HUC use PMI for credit score 620 and between 620 and 640? So there's no, uh, you know, there's no specific kind of answer to that it's going to be based on your loan amount you know uh we can give you the specifics you know with your transaction on that i don't have any more questions you guys can put some more questions we still have a few more minutes left ah here's another one in general do you need to set up an escrow account or can i save that money on my own i'm curious if it is required to have an escrow account um, just for the, yeah, for your real estate, yeah, your real estate taxes for your property taxes and your insurance. Um, generally, if you're going to have 20%, if you're putting down 20% or less under that 20% mark, a escrow account is going to be required. If you are over that mark, though, you're welcome. You can pay that, you know, manually on your own. All right. Here's another one. Is the desired home size among buyers growing or shrinking 
and an interesting quote, controlling for costs. I think family sizes are shrinking in the U.S. So wondering if three to 4,000 square foot uh, properties aren't as attractive. So there was this unusual change in buyer demand when COVID hit. Um, it was trending downward. And then in 2020, it trended upward because people wanted home offices and kids were moving home and uh, from college. So <laughs> really, it was an about face. Um, and it was really weird to, to feel that. So a lot of people were looking for bigger houses and it's still the norm. We still have 10 minutes left, so keep the questions coming. Um, here's another one. What are your thoughts on manufactured homes? So in New England, we tend not to see those. Those are more in the Southern states. Um, really rare to see manufactured homes here. There's a very low inventory amount. There's a lot of old homes that you wanna have inspections and make sure you're double checking on that. Uh, one thing I do wanna add since we have some time for people that are on this call that are gonna be purchasing condos. So condos are basically like a business. So make sure that you're looking into the condo documents and the budget Again, part of your due diligence phase, when when condo fees go into the revenue, there's expenses that come out, and then there's like a net income at the end that's called your reserve amount. So that's something also that Ryan will investigate as well. They'll they'll review the condo docs. There's a thing called a condo questionnaire that that, that Ryan will send to the association. So again, you're looking out for your best interest to make sure you're not getting into a situation that the condo is poorly run or there's deferred expenses that you're going to have to pay down the road. So very, very important when it comes to condo buyers on this call. Um, I have seen some um, manufactured homes, though, around not too far from where I live in, in the process. So is that in New England? So should people really, is it different, obviously, from buying a home in terms of um, laws and rules and regula regulations? Um, when you say manufactured, you mean it's being shipped here on a, on a trailer? No, yeah, it's manufactured. They have like communities of manufactured homes and not too far from here. So I think oh. that's what people were wondering. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some new questions. Can you give more insight about putting a home in a trust or should that wait for tomorrow's section? I'd say that's a great question for Sarah tomorrow. Okay. The attorneys on site. Thank you so much, Ryan. If my partner brought a house this year, would I be able to buy a house with my partner using my first time home buyer to help with increasing the approval? Yeah, I mean, so you could, yeah, you qualify as that first time home buyer. We can, if your partner's gonna be on the loan as well, we can absolutely, you know, factor you guys both into that pre-approval. The expenses for that property that's already been purchased though, that's going to be factored in though to your, you know, your pre-qualification. We still have 10 minutes left, people. You can just keep your questions coming. All right, here's another one. Um, have you seen some examples of an HOA going bankrupt uh -oh, or an HOA community being extremely poorly managed? Yes. Um, so 2008, eight nine, the financial collapse, I, I did have you know people not paying their condo fees and associations pretty much getting to the close, getting to the point where they almost were insolvent. Um, but that's, again, part of the process of when you're interested in a condo, going through, doing your due diligence, and not getting into a bad situation. Right, Ryan? <laughs> that's correct. All right. We're going to wrap up, but we do have one final question. Please explain, explain the outcome, the income to mortgage approved, for example, if one makes X amount, what will be approved? Okay, so, I mean, the max, you know that the income ratio we're looking for is 43%. So again, this is, you know, very specific. Give us a call. We'll set up a time and, and discuss it for you and go over everything in detail. Again, thank you so much, uh, Ryan, uh, Kim, and Dino for joining us. And thank you all of you for sticking around and um, joining us today. Uh, of course, join us tomorrow and the rest of the week and uh, follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook. And again, this is being recorded and we, we will be on our YouTube channel at my HUECU. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It was a great time. All right. Great information here. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks.